So I, I want to look at a really, really interesting and kind of surprising application of these adjacency matrices. And rather than just kind of jumping right into the theorem, uh, I, I want to start off with an example that, that illustrates what our result is going to be so you can kind of see it happen. So I, I've got a, a graph here for us to work with. And what I want to start off with is getting the adjacency matrix of this graph. All right, so if you like, you can pause. If you want to get a little practice in, uh, you can work out that adjacency matrix on your own, then start the lecture back up. And this is what I came up with. Now, the next thing we need to do is we need to calculate G squared. All right, so I want to take this matrix and multiply it by itself. Again, if you like, take a little, take a little moment to practice. Uh, you can pause the presentation here. And this is my result for G squared. All right, now look back over at the graph. This is where it's going to get interesting. I want you to think about how many two-step circuits are, there are between V1 and itself. All right, so for example, E1, E2 would be one. Right, it, it's got two. It's length two because it's got two edges, and it starts and ends at V1. So take a minute, see if you can see if you can plot out uh, where all of those are. If you need a little hint, you should come up with five of them all together. So th these are the ones that I came up with, and yes, going in a different direction counts, right? So I have both E1, E2, and E2, E1. I'm going to count those differently. Right, be because I mean, if you, if you think about all the way back to our Königsberg bridge problem, right? E1 and E2 would be different bridges, so yeah, that that would be uh, a different circuit. Now, here's the cool part. We looked at the these are the number of walks of length two between V1 and V1. Well, if you look at the one one entry of G squared. It's equal to five. It's equal to that number of circuits. All right, so let's try another one. All right? See if you can see if you can map out all of the again sticking to walks of length two, but this time let's not do a circuit. Let's do between v1 and v4. So. Excuse me, I remember that wrong. <laughs> don't don't do one and four. Do two and four. Right, find all the walks of length two between V2 and V4. See what you can come up with. Now, doing that, you should have come up with these four. Right, E1, E4, E2, E4, E5, E3, and E6, E3. Now, think about what I asked for. Right, I asked for V2 to V4. So if we look at the row two, column four, entry in the g squared matrix look at that it's equal to the number of walks of length two and now check check this real quick right because the number of walk two lengths between two and four should be the same as the number of walks of that length between four and two and if we look at the entry in the row four column two space yeah that's also equal to uh, the number of walks of that length Okay, really weird result. I mean, that that, that to, to me at least uh, is really cool, but definitely not something I would have intuitively expected to happen. So now let's look at the theorem. If we have a graph and it has n vertices, and A is its adjacency matrix, then if we look at A to the k power. The entry in the i, j position is the number of walks of length k between vertex i and vertex j, which is just what we were seeing in the last uh, in those last examples, right? We're looking specifically at k equals two, so we're looking at walks of length two, uh, and that was kind of illustrating what we're seeing here, what well, what this theorem says we should see. So, how are we going to prove this? Uh, well, first, I'm going to just kind of start off with the, with the obvious beginning, right? I'm going to start with a graph, uh, and I'm going to assume it has m vertices, and A is going to be its adjacency matrix. Then I'm, I'm going to define this statement, right? I'm going to let P of m 
be the statement for all integers i equals 1 to 2, 1, 2 out to n. The a sub ij entry of matrix a to the m represents the number of m length walks between the i j vertices. Now, in case you didn't guess, just by the way I've by the way I've phrased this here, uh, yeah, we're we're gonna do this uh, proof by induction on the size, uh, excuse me, not on the size of the matrix. We're gonna do it by the uh, length of the walk. So. Uh, the base case, P of 1, th th this one is really kind of trivial. Um, a to the first is just the original adjacency matrix. And the, each element of the adjacency matrix tells me how many single edges there are connecting each pair of vertices. Well, a single edge is a walk of length 1. And so we, we get that one uh, kind of by default. Okay, so this is the induction step. Right, we're going to assume that the statement is true for P of K, and we need to show that it's true for P of K plus one. Okay, so here's how I'm going to start this off. Right, I, I'm going to define, I'm going to let the original matrix A be defined as A sub IJ. In other words, when I when I refer to um, elements with the with the variable A, that's referring to the original matrix. When I'm referring to elements uh, with a variable B, those are coming from A to the K. And finally, uh, when I refer to elements of a matrix with a variable C, those are the elements of the A to the K plus one matrix. Now, remember our definition of uh, matrix multiplication, A to the K plus one is equal to A times A to the K. Okay. So uh, again, our, our definition of matrix multiplication at, at the kind of at the individual entry level, C sub I J is equal to this expression here. Uh, I'm, I'm taking the elements of A. And you, you notice that uh, the first index stays constant for the A's. So I'm looking at it, the ith row of A. And the second index for the B stays constant. So I'm looking at the jth column of that A to the K matrix. Okay. So look at this first term. A sub 1, excuse me, A sub I 1. That is the I1 entry of the original base adjacency matrix. So that's telling me the number of edges, the number of walks of length one, if you like, between V sub I and V sub one. Now, B sub one J, that came from the A to the K matrix. So that's telling me the number of walks of length K between V sub one and V sub J. All right, well, if, if we kind of put these together, these are all walks of length k plus 1. Right? Remember, that's what we're looking for, right? These are the uh, walks of length k plus 1 between v sub i and v sub j, specifically ones where the first step is v sub 1. Okay, well, if, if you apply um, our product rule, going back to our, our discussion of combinatorics, the total number of paths of length k plus 1 between v sub i and v sub j, where v sub 1 is the first step in the walk, is equal to the product of a sub i1 and b sub 1j. So that's what we're getting from that first term. right? That first term is telling me how many walks of length k plus 1 there are between v sub i and v sub j that have v sub 1 as their first step. Okay, hopefully you're starting to get a glimmer of where this is going now, right? If we look at the next term, this tells me, I'm using the exact same terminology here, this tells me the number of walks of length k plus 1 between, again, between v sub i and v sub j, whose first step is v sub 2. The next term will give me the ones whose first step is v sub 3, v sub 4, all the way out to that last term, um, which is the number of walks of length k plus 1, whose second step is 
v sub n. Well, that's all the possibilities. Right? We've gone through all the possible first steps there. So if we add those up, we must get the grand total walks of length k plus 1 between v sub i and v sub j. And that equals to c sub i j term uh, in matrix a to the k plus 1, which is what we wanted to show. Okay, so for me, that really is, is one of the coolest proofs we've seen so far. Um, not only because the, the result is so interesting and kind of non-intuitive, but because of all the tools that it brings together. Right? We, we used um, the adjacency matrix from graph theory as, as a way to represent the graph. We used uh, a proof by induction, which, which from back when we talked about sequences, we, we really kind of quietly used uh, what's called a proof by exhaustion. We, we essentially looked at all of the different possible second steps. And, and then we also brought in some ideas from combinatorics, right? The, the, uh, the product rule, multiplication rule, uh, to find the number of those, those individual walks based on their second step. So a, a lot of techniques really came together in that proof, which to me just makes it a really... Uh, kind of interesting thing for us to look at at this point. So um, th this is uh, our, our end of the, uh, the end of our explicit discussion of adjacency matrices, although they'll come up again from time to time. Uh, looking ahead to the next lecture, uh, we're going to take a look at one of the fundamental questions mathematicians think about when they start talking about an object like a graph. And, right, and that question is, is very basic, right? It's how can we tell when two graphs are in in some sense equal to each other when when they represent the same set of relationships or to use kind of the more technical term uh, we're going to talk about how to tell when two graphs are isomorphic